الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in His blessed name for granting us this life, for sustaining us, for considering us worthy to represent Him on this earth as His agents who promote good, forbid evil. And His mercy is infinite and that we are its beneficiaries for the more we struggle to purify ourselves, the greater we will be the recipients of that mercy. And the beauty of God's mercy is that it's eternal. It's not time sensitive. It's forever. Abqa. Bal tu'thirun al hayat al dunya wal akhiratu khayrun wa abqa. You love this world. Allah says it's transient. It's short lived. Even a thousand years on this earth is short lived. The hereafter is forever. Abqa. And it is superior. And we all know that the eternity of good is superior to a limited good in time. I recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sending us 124,000 prophets. First one being Adam and the last one being Muhammad ibn Abdullahi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also blessed us with scriptures for we know that without written documents intelligent beings have a difficult time understanding the protocols of what we should be doing in this transient world given the fact that we are under a trial given the fact that we have to accomplish a deed within a finite time and given the fact that the quran has warned us well asr inna al-insana lafi khusr إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّبْرِ So Allah promises us that mankind is at a loss until and unless the following are accomplished. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Meaning خسارة, loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Belief. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ They do good deeds. Tawasaw bil haq, they promote truth and justice. Tawasaw bil sabr, and they promote patience. If you really break each one of these, it is the entire component of the trial system of God in the most succinct manner, meaning that this ayah of Surah Al Asr is so succinct, it's so concise, it's so precise. We can spend a lifetime dissecting it and you will see that it comes back to its original source. But this requires for you and I to ponder, to reflect, not only to use the Quran as a book of istikhara or to put it under our heads when we go on a long trip, but rather to open it, to read it, to listen to it. You know, When Quran is recited, Allah says, listen to it. But that's just the part of it. The real message of the Quran is adoption of it, absorption of it. As there are two types of aql, aql, aqlan, ilmul, ilman. There are two types of intellect, two types of knowledge, matbu' and masmu'. 
The matwa is the one you absorb. This more is the one you heard, but didn't absorb. And Ahl al-Bayt and the Prophet and Imams have told us that the knowledge that you hear, which you do not absorb, has no benefit to you. So I encourage us all in this gathering, my dear respected sisters and brothers in Islam and outside of Islam. If you are present, we're honored to have you. Let us make it an article of faith within our souls to be the ones who absorb knowledge, not just hear it. Let us not be a conduit to tell what we heard to others. I think it is imperative and more important that we listen to it and absorb it and adopt it and adapt to it. For there is nothing greater than such results. For we find the society today is very lethargic, lazy, it's apathetic, meaning it lacks the zeal. You know, it, it lacks that desire. It's what we call lack of alacrity. You know, we have no desire to pray. We have no desire to observe the laws of Allah. We have no desire to talk about Allah. We have a desire for material and wealth and beauty, you know, to show off. And we have a desire to become rich and powerful. Those, these are not wrong to become rich and powerful. But the greatest desire is meaning behind why are you acquiring? Why do you want to be strong? Why do you want to be knowledgeable? There are people who have knowledge, but they abuse it by taking advantage of the weak through knowledge. That's an evildoer. Our desire should be to acquire knowledge and absorb it and to become an integral part of Allah's mercy. Not to become a conduit of show off when Allah says, Fawailun lil musalleen alladhinum an salatihim sahun. Woe to the prayerful one who shows off to the people to get notoriety or the one who goes to Hajj only to get the honorific title, Ya Hajj, so that they can now beguile and fool others into thinking that this is a pious religious individual. No. We should not become conduits of such. Nor should we be followers of our forefathers out of loyalty. This is ignorance in its purest form and the Quran has challenged that. In these gatherings, my respected brothers and sisters, if we are going to progress, we have to start at the level of absorbing knowledge. We have to reach that level where knowledge becomes useful, where the aql, see there's ilm and there's aql. There are people that are ulama, but there's a big difference between the ulama and the uqala. Please understand that. Ulama have knowledge, but they don't necessarily have the power to absorb. They're like encyclopedias and they will tell you details, but they don't know how to connect the dots. If you take them out of the script, they stumble. But the uqala have knowledge already because they have intellect and their intellect works when there's knowledge. The difference between the first and the second is the second understands the principles, what we call epistemic spirit. The kind of knowledge that they understand within the depth of fitra. Not simply having heard, absorbed, and bouncing off to show off to people. No. Epistemic, meaning they know the essence of knowledge. They go deep into it. And Allah calls them ulil albab. Deeply rooted in knowledge. The ones who understand the value of knowledge. Society today is like a herd of cattle. Allah says, لَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Quran doesn't lie. Allah doesn't lie. He said, لَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ Nay, most of mankind does not think. We are followers of fads. Media, Hollywood produces something, everybody runs. The movie, the music industry produces something, everybody runs. The fashion industry creates a fad, everybody runs. There's this dumb little thing where one singer did some video where he's dancing while the car is moving and he has the door open. They call it, I don't know, Kiki, Kiki or something. <laughs> and then you've got this foolish 
what we call simpletons. A simpleton is a foolish person, a person with little knowledge. Now they want to mimic it. They have to. But then they have to videotape it, of course, so that they can get some more likes. Like fools waiting to get likes. What an irony. What an irony. It's an insatiable. It's the kind of desire that will never make you happy. As the Prophet said, when you run after the world, the world runs away from you. When you run away from the world, the world comes after you. We all want the world to come after us, but we are foolish. For we have to run away from it, not towards it. So we need to show off. Oh, they did it. I need to do the same dumb video. You know how many people died, got into car accidents, doing dumb things? But there's no thought. We're like a herd of cattle. Kal-an'am bal hum adal. They are like cattle. Allah says, nay, worse. At least cattle does what a cattle is supposed to do. Humans are much more intelligent, much wiser, much more capable. Shame on the human being who lowers themselves to such levels of subhuman level. As Imam Ali salam says, the human being has the capacity to be above the angel or below the animal. When he's animalistic, he becomes less than an animal. When he's upright and intellectual and uses his wisdom to traverse the trials and tribulations of this world through patience, then that beca individual becomes higher than angels. Angels are infallible beings. They do not commit sins. Yet our prophets and imams have told us that humans can be higher than angels if they practice the gift that God has given them. You and I, sadly, we challenge certain things and then we follow certain things. There is a what we call a, a, a confused bipolar state of mind. Why we're demanding answers. Why God exists. What's the value of this hijab? Why do I need to pray? What does Islam mean? Is religion really needed? Often these questions are wonderful. I think they're brilliant. I love it when people ask such questions. I think we should. For then the aql is starting to challenge rather than us blindly following, you know, systems because our forefathers told us. We challenge. I like that. But here's the contradiction. The very person asking the validity of religion he has become a slave to the fad society and they don't ask the question of that fad. My friends are doing it, so I must do it. So why do I need religion? Oh, you're so smart asking me about religion, but you forgot to ask the other side. See, that's hypocrisy blatantly looking at you. We're cherry picking. Why don't we question everything? If my friends want me to play Fortnite because that's the coolest thing on the planet, then I should ask, what does it give me? What's my future in it? What has it done? What will it do for me tomorrow? Now, children don't have necessarily that capacity to prognosticate, as we say, to look at the future and to plan what is my next move. We as adults need to infuse that into our children through conversation, through dialogue, through role modeling, through careful modulation to improve their behaviors and to show them the parameters that a wise individual thinks long term. But today, we ourselves as adults are impulsive, lest we become compulsive. And then our children are witnessing our madness in our pursuits of the pleasures of this world, only to mimic it at another level. But we are dissatisfied by their misbehavior, only to forget that we are the examples for them. For when you see a family that's an erudite family, a family that is learned, a family that is, is indulgent in education, and conversation, and deep meditation, and reflection, and cogitation. You will generally find that their children are like that. As they say, the fruits don't fall far from the tree. Hmm? When I see children who are very smart, as we call them precocious children, children who are wise, who think deep, and they don't have to be old, they could be five years old. They don't have to be mature. We can infuse 
wisdom, even in the cradle, as Allah says, we give Isa and, you know, uh, Yahya ibn Zakaria, we gave them wisdom. Mahdi Sabiya. You see? We gave them when they were they were little, young, we gave them hikmah. So a child can get hikmah, but often we deny them that initial acceleration of growth. We expect them to become mature when they become 17, 18, 19, and then we start talking to them like adults. But the damage is done when they're 10, the damage is done when they're nine, when they're five, when they're seven. We forget those parameters. So Allah says, my religion is to be practiced, not only to be heard, while it is a huge blessing, huge, unimaginable, unthinkable, for I can certainly not count the value and the virtues of this great tragedy of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, 61 years after Hijrah, 680 AD, that the effects of that tremendous sacrifice with a small group of people has led to such gatherings that we have all changed our schedules within this night to ensure that we come we park our cars and we dedicate that one hour of reflection and we demand something that will spiritually invigorate us so that we walk out of here having done something good i smile at that and i don't care what a lifestyle we have although we should stop but somebody the other day told me, he says, I've seen some people come to your lectures who drink and dance and do all kinds of illicit misbehaviors in public, in weddings. But I see them coming to this lecture. I said, yes, we can look at it two ways. We can call them hypocrites or we can say there is hope. I'd rather look at the latter. For how dare I call anyone a hypocrite? Maybe it's work in progress. Maybe it is something that they you know, developed from childhood bad behavior, which they would love to get rid of. And maybe they found that hope in that one night or those 10 nights of Ashura, hoping that that great tragedy of Imam Hussain alayhi salam will touch my, their spirits. And so that they can make a 180 turn towards Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tawabeen. Allah loves those who turn to him. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say to my worship, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ The ones who have gone astray with their selves, who have become inordinate in their akhlaq, in their deeds. Tell them, don't lose hope. لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Don't lose hope. God forgives all sins. He forgives you. Hope. Never lose hope, brothers and sisters. And let, never point a finger at somebody who's doing haram and say, you are doomed. You are damaged goods. You can never get, get you know, grace from God. You can never recover. Don't ever say that. I don't care what kind of a drunkard they are. As I mentioned yesterday, Allah sends Musa to Fir'aun. Nobody could be worse in his time than Fir'aun. And God says there is hope in Fir'aun if he were to listen. If he were to think. And subhanallah, Allah even exposes the future. In Sutul Mulk, when these people like Fir'aun are being tossed in hell, angels are going to ask them, Alam ya'atikum nadir? Didn't a warner come to you? Subhanallah. Allah says, وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had," And Allah in the Quran says, we never punish a community till we guide it first. For there is no punishment to a community that was not guided. For if they were not guided, they're exempt. They're exonerated from such accusation. So the angel is asking, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ They will reply, قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ they will say, no, they did come. But we call them liars. When the prophets came, we accused them of being liars. We said, no, you lie to us. You are not a representative of God. You are not revealing scripture to me. You are not giving me these scriptures. There is no God. He doesn't exist. 
So don't come and tell me to follow laws. We have people like this in the world today too. We've always had them. Listen to what they will say after that. وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُوا أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ فَعَتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Look how beautiful the verse is. They will say with their own tongues, if only we listened and paid attention, meaning we processed aql, where we listened and we absorbed. Hmm? They say aql, aqlan, two kinds of intellect, the listening type and the absorbing type. In Surah Al-Mulk, the one who is doomed is now recognizing if only I listened and I absorbed I would not be the inmate of this hell. Meaning I brought myself here. Allah did not take them to hell. Allah does not take his creations to hell easily. Allah did not create us for hell. We were not made to go to hell. No human being has been created for hell. Allah is too merciful to do that. But he honors us by placing hell there to give us value. For then he warns us that rise, follow, do the right thing. Why? Allah says, if I don't put that threat, you won't understand its value. But I am putting this threat not to threaten you, but to value you. For we know heroes are the ones who went through danger. That's why they're unique in heroes. Allah says, my creation should be heroes. You and I should be supreme. How? That we avoided the dangers. For if danger didn't exist, we'd be shrugging our shoulders. What's the big deal? Why should I have to struggle? I'm already sliding into paradise anyway. Who cares? But Allah says, no. You will enter paradise. But which stage of paradise do you want? For there is a lower stage of paradise and there is a high stage of paradise. Which one do you want? Now, I have never found a human being on earth were I to ask them that question that A is good, meaning the lower paradise is good. And B is the high paradise, which is the best. And I offer it to them, which one do you want? You would have to be out of your mind to take the first one. You would have to be mentally questionable. Because you say, why did you take A when B is available? Do you know most of us are taking A? Hajj. I just want to, you know, enter paradise. Why are you so doomed? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm such a sinner. And Shaitan says, yeah, he's mine. He's my kind. He's my buddy. And you and I said, yeah, what am I going to do? I'm a loser. And Shaitan says, remember that's weed that you smoke? Come on. You're already tainted. You're already infected. Come with me. Come on, let's do more. It's like Stalin says, you know, when you kill the first person, it's murder. After that, it's a statistic. I did it anyway, so who cares? Let me do more. When Allah says, no, don't do that. I sent 124,000 prophets to teach you not to do that. And even if you did, don't lose hope. It's okay. But notice how beautiful Allah is exposing. Aql, in its purest form, when it is engaged and absorbed, you avoid hell. And when it is practiced, it takes you to the highest stations of paradise. For then your nature just flows with it because knowledge starts to work. That's why I mentioned in, in Surah Isra, Allah says, In Nahad al Qur'an, yahdi lati aqwam. Indeed, this Quran guides you to that which is most upright. As I mentioned yesterday, it is a book of morals. It has stories, but every story in the Quran is not to entertain us. It is to give us a lesson of how we should behave and how we should avoid and what lessons we need to take. Did you notice the Quran is filled with stories of prophets and non-prophets? Why is it there? Because we human beings relate through other examples. That's why the movie industry thrives so much. We all want to know how the rich live. 
We all want to know how the poor live. We all want to know how orphans are abused. We all want to know, we want to know, we want to know. We are curious and there is no greater curiosity than to see what others are doing. Human nature. Our nature is gregarious in nature, meaning we're social beings. We learn through examples. That's why teenagers and younger youth are so loyal to their friends because their entire nature, their entire identity is reflective of their friends. We never give up on that. That's why we are so afraid of giving up our friends, even if they are wrong, because we feel we will be alone. And therefore, we become party to crime simply to maintain that loyalty and relationship. We no longer observe Allah's law. If our friends tell us to do haram, we join them. Why? Because we don't want to lose loyalty. This is how gangs work. Gangs will commit the most heinous crimes precisely for this reason. For the gang leaders got you with the, with the rope of loyalty. The gang leader is going to tell you, are you loyal to me? He said, yes. Well, here's a gun. Go kill. And if you don't, you're not with me. So they will go and do, they'll commit crimes they don't want to commit. You and I on subtle levels, we cheat, we lie. We become immodest, indecent. Because our friends want it. Why? Because our aql is not working. We're bouncing off, listening and just following like a herd of cattle. When Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا أَوَلَا كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ يَدْعُوا مِلَا عَذَابِ السَّيْءِ Allah asks us the question. When they are told, this is by the way in Surah Luqman, 31st chapter, when they are told to follow that which they have been revealed by God, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ they said, no, we follow our forefathers. With all due respect, Christians are Christians because their forefathers were Christians. Jews are Jews because their forefathers were Jews. Muslims are Muslims because majority of their forefathers were Muslims. We are followers of Ahlul Bayt because the majority of us inherited this from our forefathers. Now, the school of Ahlul Bayt is right. It is correct. But ironically and tragically, spiritually, many of us don't even understand the value of the, of the great truth of Islam within us because we're simply following what we inherited. And we hope that when our children grow up, they will follow us due to loyalty. Not validation that is my religion correct. Not validation, how is it correct? Not validation, how do I know mine is better than the rest? How do I know that this pathway is the path of God? Majority of us are loyal to our forefathers and we will die on the battlefield maintaining that loyalty. But I'm telling us all, such loyalty has zero meaning to Allah. And Allah will question us. Did you ponder? So you were born in a Muslim family. Did you ponder? Many of us, by the way, we ponder, oh, I don't know why Islam is right. So you know what? I'm going to give it up. I said, you're going to give it up for what? No Islam. I said, so you're certain that no Islam is right? No. I said, then why are you giving it up? That's a dumb move. Like, why would you give it up? You don't know. Why don't you go validate it and know for sure that it's wrong? Then give it up. How many have that capacity? Very few. We have no time. You sit around and see how much reflection or conversation that is valuable. Some of us asking, what lies between the second heaven and the third heaven? I've had people ask that question. Hajj, so what lies between second heaven and third heaven? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Did you know there are many layers of heaven? So I said to him, what, how did you come to the second? You mastered the first? And how many are there? Oh, there are seven. Oh, and how are they broken up? I said, I don't know. And if I told you what's happening on the second, what will he do for you? I said, I'm just curious. I said, why don't you go home and look at your spouse, hug your children, listen to them, talk to them, fix your problems before you fix or try to figure out the secrets of the second to the third heaven. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
Did you notice sometimes when we get in, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Saluni, Saluni, Qabla an tafqiduni. Ask me, ask me before I'm buried. A man says, Amir al Mu'mineen, how much hair do I have? Allahu Akbar. I could just imagine myself sitting there. I would put my hands on my head and say, Ya Allah, the gem of God is here. The wealth of knowledge is here. Every second ticking towards his death day is a loss for us. And to ask him pertinent questions that will help us, we're being sarcastic. Hmm? How much hair? Imam says there's as much hair as there are devils on you. Good answer. Because you are stupid in asking such dumb question. No question is dumb, by the way. But to ask a rhetorical question that's basically condescending in nature is in itself riddled with a negative akhlaq. So the Imam looks at him and says, we didn't come to entertain you with such knowledge. Ask us pertinent questions and you know what they are. For there are many things that riddle you every single day. Why don't you ask that rather than us? Acquiring mundane knowledge about the shoe sizes of superstars and what kind of clothes they like and what do they eat. Now, that's secondary tertiary knowledge. Sitting and gaining knowledge with reflective power is the most powerful thing. Allah says, Inna fi khalq samawati wal ard, wa ikhtilaf al layl wal nahar, la ayatin li uli al albab. Indeed, in the creation of the sky and the earth, in the alternation of night and day, are signs for people who reflect. People who are deeply rooted in knowledge. Who are they? Allah describes it beautifully in the Quran. قِيَامًا وَقْعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They reflect standing, sitting, lying on their sides. Reflective. يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ Dhikr. We must teach our children dhikr. Absorption of knowledge. And adoption of knowledge. So when Allah says, indeed this Quran guides you to that which is most upright, give good news to those who practice it. فَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ The ones who do good. That for them is a great reward. Religion of God is all about action. You know, when you act on something, it's louder than words. You don't have to tell anybody anything. Your deeds. See? Isa salam says, judge a man by the fruits he bears or she bears. Judge that person by the fruits they bear. For their action bears the fruits. There are people who talk a lot. Constant talking, grandiose ideas, but nothing comes. They tell you, Hajj, do this project. Mashallah, we need A. For the community, we need B. This is why we don't have A. And this is why we have a problem with B. This is, oh, mashallah, brilliant. Brilliant analysis. Then you tell them, okay, put $5 here. Let's start. Hajj, you start. Inshallah, I'll join you when the crowd is big. <laughs> because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all just going to join the bandwagon. So where were you when you started? Well, you know, talk is cheap. I mean, you know, to act on it, <laughs> it's not an easy task. We love Imam Hussain alayhi He didn't talk about love of Allah. He didn't pontificate. He didn't sit in his house and do dhikr all night. He rose. He says, In kana deen Muhammadin lam yastaqim illa biqatli. If this religion cannot stand except by my death, then come. I am ready for it. I have no fear. I love those people. Indomitable. Where Allah says they fear nothing. They go forward. Like Allah says to Yahya. Ya Yahya. Khudil kitab bi quwa. Oh Yahya. Take the law and move. You are sitting around not doing things. Religion has become an entitlement. Many Muslims come and say, Hajj, that's a kafir. I look at him and say, what do you mean? But he's not Muslim. He's not just. I look at him and say, oh, mashallah, you're so pure. 
ولا مسلم يو نو هيدي الشهادتين اما شيعة علي يو نو لوكينج ماي زوفيكار ما شاء الله فيري نايس يو زوفيكار از فيري نايس اي سيد دو يو سي يور سيلف وذ امام حسين اف هي كولد يو يو نو ذير وير ثاوزندز لايك اس ذات سيد ذا سيم ثينغ ذي فولود امام حسين اول ذا واي تو كربلاء اند ذن ذي اول وينت هوم بيكوز يو نو تو اكت put your money where your mouth is that's what really counts on judgment day that's what allah will ask what did you do did you act did you absorb did you ponder you know brothers i'll tell you when allah says la ikraha fi ad-din qad tabayyana ar-rushd min al-ghay there is no compulsion in religion truth is clear from error you know how truth becomes clear from error when aql starts to work when intellect starts to absorb truth becomes clear you know it's an irony when sisters come and ask me hajj i'm not convinced about hijab even in this in our school here we are allowing a little flexibility and freedom we're testing this talk in the community oh why is this an islamic school it's allowing some sisters oh, what's going on is it islamic See, I can easily promote blind following. It's very easy. Put laws all over the wall. Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. How dare thou does this? How dare thou does that? Thou shall be X, thou shall be Y. Woo-hoo, we're scared. It's an Islamic school, ISIS. You said, no, no. My Islam is aql. I'm fed up. with this blind following of deen where we are we're like a bunch of drones and robots simply mimicking our forefathers where is the thought where is the value that even those sisters parents come and say haj i'm afraid my daughter will take her hijab off i said so she's walking on the edge of a sword her hijab has no value for if there's one whimsical sister who passes by without a hijab oh i need to take it off too what happened to your senses what happened to the aql i was so whimsical to the environment that the minute there is a breeze our tree falls apart what happened to the strength of iman what happened to the validity that i am a muhajjaba i am going to become the ambassador to teach you no 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 have it rigid this is the only way to teach children rigid laws and then you find they become teenagers and they become atheists they declare their atheism because now they are adults and then the parents are crying my child has become an atheist i said yeah you shove religion down their throat and there was no conversation there was no feeling of freedom and they always thought the grass is green on the other side so it's very easy to you know encapsulate a religion under a bubble and bring everybody into this bubble and make them feel like we're so sanitized and pure yet the level of debauchery lying cheating within our community is growing at an alarming rate and our children are getting lost to drug abuse and illegitimacy and all kinds of problems and we're turning a blind eye thinking imam mahdi alayhi salam is going to fix it i don't think so i think you and i have an obligation to challenge our aql you know there's a beautiful hadith in al kafi jibril comes down i want to touch on this briefly i'll talk about this situation more and it's not only about this hijab with the sisters hijab with the brothers same this clothing that our sisters wear is the outer garb we have an outer garb to our hijab it's not only aimed at our sisters here hijab is holistic men and women i promise you at every level our demeanor our use of language our body language the way we look the way we talk the way we transact is all hijab jibril comes down to adam after adam is on earth and jibril says god has appointed me to offer you three things but you must only choose one it says aql deen haya three things you offered intellect divine path the path of god or modesty haya choose one brilliant you know when i ponder on this conversation the imam is explaining i said subhanallah what religion on earth has this i have never found a religion with the kind of depth 
and clarity and firmness as this deem. And I don't claim to be a master in other religions, but I've studied them enough. And Adam says, I want aql. I choose intellect. So Jibrail, it's a metaphor, but it's actually reality. Don't be fooled. They are actual living entities. Jibrail says to Deen and Haya, leave, go. Adam has chosen what he has chosen. The two of you left over, leave. You know what the two reply? Brilliant. This is the principle I follow. And I will do my best in my life to follow this. The two reply that God has commanded us wherever aql is, we must be. So we can't leave. Now, if Adam would have chosen deen or haya with no aql, then aql would have separated from them. But notice the axis of God's law is built on intellect. So when a sister or a brother comes to me, says, brother, convince me about modesty. Convince me that I need to cover my body. Hijab, sisters and brothers, cover the body, please. We think it's the hair. You wear a headscarf, you're mahajaba. No, it's work in progress. It's not mahajaba, sisters. It's not mahajaba, brothers. Please, let's not fool ourselves. We have boiled it down and narrowed it into a very myopic vision. And this is why we're getting lost. That's why our young girls are confused. They don't understand. Hijab is a barrier. Ya yuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna. Thalika adna an yu'rafna fala yu'udayna. O Prophet, your wives, your daughters, and the believing women, that they cover their bodies. It is better for them so that they are recognized in an elevated way and therefore they are not bothered. Now you might think this is some absurd law of God that has put a burden on us. As I mentioned yesterday, Allah says, We didn't make religion difficult for you. We are helping you. We argue. Sisters, we all know. Brothers, we all know. When aql is pushed aside, and impulse is used as a driving force, we damage ourselves. The Me Too movement is an excellent example. Our women have been subjected to tyranny. You know, if you saw advertisements in the 60s and 70s, women were nothing but an object of pleasure for men. Haram. Allah says, Ya yuhannas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila, lita'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. What an elegant verse. Mankind, we made you male and female, nations and tribes, so you know each other due to diversity and beauty and functions. And Allah says, the most honorable to Allah is one who's got conscious. No man is superior to a woman. No woman is superior to a man. But we have used them as tilth and pleasure points that we cannot even sell cigarettes without putting a woman. We cannot sell a car without putting a woman next to it. We've done it. In the expression of freedom, aql has stopped working. It's impulse. The economist wants to gain money. Pornography is booming. There's no aql there. It's impulse. Throw the money. Put the credit cards. Let me watch it. It's impulse. The brain is not working. You become a slave. And then shaitan says, come. When there is aql, you say, hold on. Hold on. Even the most reckless in families... Know that when a man is married and his secretary is in the room with her husband, she will suspect. Now I say to them, why are you suspecting? That's your life. This is normal to you. No, no, I can't. If he does that, I'm going to divorce him. I said, you grew it. It's the tree you grew on. It's the tree you watered. Now you're worried about it. 
You know the irony about this whole Me Too movement? Women have been so abused by who? Some of the most powerful figures on earth. Bill O'Reilly was making over $100 million a year. He was a misogynist. He belittled women. Charlie Rose. This man could pick up the phone and talk to any leader on earth and he would get a president. That's how powerful he is, how talented he is, how rich he is, but he's got no akhlaq. His foundation is lacking. There's no haya. You know why there's no haya? There is no aql. They're simply bouncing knowledge. No thought. They're experts in that, but no thinking, no reflection. Not the type that Allah says they sit, they stand, and they reflect. Look at the difference. You might think rich and powerful. They were all rich. Harvey Weinstein, a monster in Hollywood. Monster. How many women has he abused? Thousands. And women were just getting in there like droves. And today they've realized, no. If we don't cover ourselves, these men will never stop abusing us. Now, the men are guilty 100%. This is not to blame just the women. It's a two-way relationship. It takes two to tangle. But the point I'm saying is, when aql doesn't work, there is no haya. When aql doesn't work, there is no haya. But unprecedented in history. The Miss America pageant started during the Depression to keep the men busy. And they had reached a stage where women were scantily walking on runways, displaying their body. And people were like drooling. And women are proud, look at me. And then if they are used as objects of advertising, I wonder who should I blame? Is it a blaming game? SubhanAllah. Here's the problem. Unprecedented after the Me Too movement, Finally, aql is kicking in. This year, they removed the swimsuit and they removed the, night, the gown. I said, bravo. Finally, aql is working. And I'm saying to our sisters, pay attention. These experts who promote freedom of expression are coming back your way. So hold high your flag of modesty and say, here we are. We've always been there. Join us. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. One final quick story. I was in Dubai and there was a Catholic girl who said, I would like to debate you. I said, no problem. She said, I want to prove to you Christ is the son of God. I said, no problem. We sat down at somebody's house. It was very hot. It was well over 90 degrees in the room. She was wearing three quarter sleeves. And I've mentioned this before in my lecture, but I've had many cases like this. This is one that was most profound. It was so clear to me. She was sitting there talking to me. We were... 90 degrees sitting. And as we're talking, she's telling me about why Christ is the son of God. And I was quoting the Bible and telling her, no, this is not Jesus. Jesus never said that. Jesus says, why callest thou me good? There is none good but that which sent me. So don't put words into Jesus' mouth. Jesus was an honorable human being. Don't say that. So as I got her engaged, I said, sister, why don't we talk about the father? The God you and I worship. When people ask me, who do you worship? When a Christian asks me, I say, I worship the God of Christ. The same God Jesus worshipped, I worship. Oh, really? Wow, you're Christian. I said, yeah, I believe in Isa as Masih. Yes, but not the type you believe in. But I worship the same God Jesus worshipped. He prayed too. Oh, yeah, yeah, he did. So as I'm talking about God... And I said, God, the merciful, he's here. As we say to our kids, he's ubiquitous, he's present, he's everywhere. And as I'm talking, she's looking at me and she starts to cringe. And she's pulling her sleeve. Now, it was very hot, so it wasn't cold. But she did this and she started, she suddenly realized maybe I am not so well dressed. Everybody in the room looked at it. She says, wow, she was odd. She started to cringe and cover herself. And she, as she's even leaving, she had her hand like this. I thought, I don't know what happened. Like, but I realized, hold on. Allah's presence came into our spirit. She felt the presence of God. 
and aql probably turned on and haya became active. Oh, wait, I can't. No, 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 no. Allah says, now you're real. See, when we don't think that way, then we become impulsive. Why shouldn't I? Let me show my hair. I said, you're already beautiful. Who said you're ugly? You sure, brother? You sure I'm not ugly? So why, you want to put a sign here? Let's stop and see. To end tonight, Allah's religion is the religion of forgiveness. Allah says, وَسَارِعُ إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْدِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Hasten to forgiveness, for there is a paradise that awaits you, greater than the earth and the sky put together. And who are you? You give charity in good times and in bad times. You hold back your anger and you do good deeds and you forgive mankind. God loves the good doers. This was Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Hur was the commander of Yazid's army, Ibn Ziyad's army, who was sent to intercept Imam Hussein as Imam Hussein is going towards Kufa. And he meets him in this place called Dhu Hassan. Imam is already encamped. And Imam was taking a back route. He wasn't taking the main highway because he was trying to avoid this confrontation. So he's taking the back route and Hur is looking for him, chasing him the other way. So he also had to take the inside roads. By the time he arrives in Zuhassan, Imam actually is already encamped and they saw palm trees approaching them. And the soldier comes to Imam Hussain Alayhi At that time, by the way, Imam had a few thousand soldiers. He said, wait, there is an army coming. Imam said, let it come. Who comes? Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Famous personality. To me, he represents this verse. He represents hasten to forgiveness. Do not slow down. Don't say tomorrow I'll ask for forgiveness. Allah says now. You don't know if you will die tonight. So Hur arrives and he's thirsty, emaciated as they say. His horses are about to collapse. Imam just had to touch them and the whole thousand army that Hur had was going to collapse. Imam looks at Hur and says, you are thirsty. He knows this is the enemy who has come to stop him. Imam says, feed him and feed his horses. And all the horses were given water. All the soldiers were given water. Imam made sure he personally served them. What a difference between that akhlaq and what the Umayyads did in Karbala. The same Umayyad tactic that Muawiyah used against Imam Ali in the Battle of Siffin, where he tried to prevent water from the army, for the, from the army of Imam Ali alayhi salam. The same strategy. It's only a coward who does that. Cowards use such tactics to try to weaken the enemy. But our Imams were too strong that even if there was no water, as you know, water ran, they say that the water stopped flowing and there was no water on the 7th of Muharram. That's when the army blocked the Imam from reaching the Euphrates. But you find Hur is meeting Imam Hussein, but he has tremendous respect for Imam Hussein. While he's on the opposite army, he has respect. So, Imam says, it's Salah time. You guys can pray, we will pray. Hur says, no, our army will pray behind you. Subhanallah, that spirit of God, the love of Ahl al-Bayt is already in Hur. He's a commander, he's a strong fighter, but notice he's no coward. So he prays behind Imam Hussain. Imam leads the Salah. Then as the Imam is about to leave, Hur holds his horse. So the Imam says, why are you holding my horse? He says, I've been commanded that you cannot go to Kufa. So Imam says, may you be deprived of your mother's milk. It's an expression. He looks at the Imam, he says, I cannot say that to you. Because your mother was too great a woman. Fatima al-Zahra, salamu alayha, was too great a woman that for me to respond to you. But look at the beauty. The Imam is doing da'wah. He's engaging aql. 
He's doing role modeling. He's showing him, oh, hur, you've made a wrong choice now, but don't lose hope. Watch, you will change. Give it time. Wait, give it time. So he blocks Imam from reaching Kufa and he pushes him northeast. And as the Imam is going, he was on the ninth stop out of the 14. 14th was Karbala. On the ninth stop, he meets Hur. From ninth to the 14th stop, Hur is on his way blocking the Imam. He doesn't let the Imam go eastward. Until finally Imam reaches Karbala. And he finds his camels and horses don't want to move. They don't want to move. So the Imam is pushing them. So they don't want to move. So Imam is asking the people of the town, what is this land called? They say, Nainawa. Imam says, Nainawa. What's another name for it? They said, Karbala. Imam says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. I have reached my destiny. For my grandfather told me, this is where I will be sacrificed. So he calls the people of Banu Asad. He said, who owns this land? They said, the Banu Asad owns the land. Imam says, I want to buy this land from you. The Banu Asad said, why? Why do you want to buy this piece of desert? He says, because when we, what will happen soon, we do not want it to be on anybody's land but ours. Look at the clarity of God's messenger that even in the massacre, even though he is being taken prisoner, even though he is being unfairly killed, even the land where his blood is going to drip, it has to belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the clarity of religion you will never find anywhere in the world. And Imam camps there and he puts his tents by the Euphrates and his backyard was the Euphrates. That's when he arrives. On the 10th day of Ashura, Hur is watching this dialogue going between Imam Hussein and Umar ibn Sa'ad back and forth. And Hur is agitated because he's hoping that this war does not start. He said, that man is the man of God. I am stuck on this side in the wrong direction. But let it diffuse so that I do not have to make such a choice. They say when Ashura started, the 10th day, Umar ibn Sa'ad takes the arrow. He says, witness me, Umar ibn Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. I'm starting this war and I hereby am attacking Hussein ibn Ali. When the war began, early on, Hur ascends on his horse and he is now full of trepidation. His horse is moving in all directions. The soldiers come to him. They said, oh Hur, you look very disturbed. He says, I'm deciding between dunya and akhira. Do I want this world with its lies and its foolishness? Or should I go and sacrifice for the real life? He says it secretly to a few. Then he kicks the horse and he runs on the opposite side. And Imam is by the tent watching this horse come towards him. Hur descends a bit further away from the Imam. He comes down and he gradually approaches the Imam like a slave. Imam says, come Hur, we were expecting you. Allah says, hasten to forgiveness. Don't lose hope. Don't say your damaged goods. Hur says, you will accept me to be with you after I brought you here. I'm the one who caused you to come to Karbala. Imam says, it's okay, Hur. You did what you were commanded to do. But now you've used your aql, Hur. You've made this decision to come. Come. So as the battle begins early morning at Fajr time, Hur goes to Imam Hussain salam and says, give me permission. To be the first one to go and fight. For I owe it to myself that I should stand up there and reason with these enemies that maybe they will wake up and stop attacking you. Imam says to Hur, go. Hur stands in front of him and says, Oh, people of Kufa, you invited this man. You, his, you invited this grandson of the Prophet. This is the grandson of the Prophet who the Prophet said his flesh is, you know, their flesh is his flesh. Have you forgotten that? And as the people are starting to think, Ibn Sa'ad throws an arrow towards Hur. He says, be quiet. Because he knows if he continues to talk, maybe some of these people will change their minds. So Hur begins to fight. He fights and he fights and he comes back. 
Then Hur goes again with Zuhair ibn Khaim. As you know, Zuhair was the commander of one of the flanks. There were three flanks. Abbas was in the middle. Zuhair was on one side. Habib ibn Madahir was on the other side. Hur was with Zuhair ibn Khaim fighting. And as he fought fiercely, Imam is watching him. I am thinking, oh Hur, you made the right choice. Will I make that choice before I die? Will I make that choice that you made? Then will I change my life? The way you did on that battlefield. Oh, you are my master. <laughs> Hur is struck. Two people jump on him. And they martyr her on the floor, on the ground. And they see a big gash was on his forehead. The blood was gushed. Imam goes and carries him. Before Hur dies, he says, Hur, your mother has named you well. For Hur means free. Oh Hur, you are free in this world and free in the next world. And Imam takes his handkerchief given by his mother and he wraps it around Hur's forehead and says, we will meet soon in the next world. We will meet soon in the next world. ألا لعنة الله إلى القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقذر ينقذبون السلام عليك يا بعض وعلى الأرواح التي حملت بفناك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنار ولا جعل الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاه يا أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينب وبنتك رقية جميعا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن سلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد Please remain seated for a few minutes. There's but me a few minutes. I know it's a bit late, but may Allah bless you for your patience. Please recite Surah Al-Fatiha for Rab Uthman. As you know, he drowned over the summer. Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha.